It's all right to be just a little bit crazy. Being creative is being a little bit crazy in just the right vibration. With that in mind, you should understand God's completely insane. <laughs> From the perspective of those who dominate the board, it is obviously preferable to have a population of ignorant pawns than it is to have an array of opponents which are capable of mounting an effective resistance. To that end, it has always been in the interest of the ruling class to cultivate illusions which obscure the true nature of the game. Manufacturing consent. What is that title meant to describe? Well, the title is actually borrowed from uh, a book by Walter Lippmann written back uh, around 1921, in which he described what he called the manufacture of consent as a revolution in the practice of democracy. What it amounts to is a technique of control. Uh, and he said this was useful and necessary because uh, the common interests, the general concerns of all people, elude the public. Walter Lippmann wasn't speaking theoretically, nor was he commenting on a phenomenon that he had observed from a distance. He was part of that specialized class, and he personally influenced the development of this new technique, control. So what was this new technique that Lippmann was referring to? The answer to that question takes us back to the beginning of World War I. In 1917, Woodrow Wilson formed the Committee on Public Information, also known as the CPI. It was a propaganda agency, and its purpose was to build support for the war with the American people. The CPI, run by a man named George Creel, was known for its crude tactics, blatant exaggerations, and outright lies. However, one member of the CPI, Edward Bernays, had a much more subtle approach. Rather than resorting to lowbrow tactics, Bernays studied the mindset of the American people, and then based on his observations, he created a campaign to promote the idea that America's purpose in the war was to, quote, make the world safe for democracy. This meme was wildly successful, so much so that it continues to be used even to this day. Edward Bernays was Sigmund Freud's nephew, and like his uncle, he was an avid student of human psychology. Some documentarians, such as Adam Curtis and his film The Century of the Self, have mistakenly assumed that the psychological techniques that Bernays went on to develop were merely the practical application of Freud's theories. However, though Freud had a significant influence on his nephew, the reality of the matter is that he was not the source of these ideas. Sigmund Freud, Edward Bernays, and Walter Lippmann all subscribed to a school of thought that was first put forth in 1895 by a French social psychologist named Gustave Le Bon. Le Bon wrote several books, the most famous of which was entitled Psychologie des Foules. It was translated into English as The Crowd, a study of the popular mind. The Crowd was a revolutionary piece of work. In it, Le Bon not only presented an in-depth description of group psychology and how it differed from individual psychology, but he also outlined a very simple set of principles that enable leaders to spark ideological contagion and thereby rise to power. Hitler, Goebbels, and Mussolini all studied Le Bon's writings, and they applied his techniques to the letter. The results that they attained were precisely those that Le Bon claimed that they would have. Funny how they leave that little detail out of most history books, don't you think? Sigmund Freud's book, Group Psychology and the Analysis of the Ego, was in fact a direct critique of the writings of Gustav Le Bon and William McDougall, which focused on the relationship between individual psychology and group psychology, and explained how human groups can be controlled for long periods of time through the manipulation of group identity, belief systems, and social structures. Edward Bernays studied the writings of Freud, Le Bon, Wilfred Trutter, Walter Lippmann, and many others. He then combined their perspectives and synthesized them into an applied science. The success of his Make the World Safe for Democracy meme during the war, both at home and abroad, planted the seed of an idea in Bernays' mind. Could group psychology tactics be applied during peacetime? When I came back to the United States, I decided that if you could use propaganda for war, you could certainly use it for peace. And propaganda got to be a bad word because of the Germans using it. So what I did 
was to try to find some other words. So we found the word Council on Public Relations. In 1919, Bernays opened the world's first public relations office. He named his agency the Council on Public Relations. This was Bernays' specialty, engineering social trends for clients. And he was very, very good at it. Perception was now a commodity for sale of the highest bidder. What made Bernays so successful was his skill in applying three psychological tactics. One, creating carefully calculated associations with the subconscious fears and desires of individuals. Two, influencing opinion leaders and perceived authority figures in order to reach those who follow them. Three, initiating the contagion of behaviors and ideas through social conformity. Bernays wrote several books promoting these psychological tactics, including propaganda and crystallizing public opinion. In these books, he specifically encouraged governments and corporations to use his methodology to manipulate public perception. This suggestion did not fall on deaf ears. His techniques worked so well that they were adopted by virtually every sector that sought to influence the public media, politics, advertising, even the military. As Walter Lippmann had indicated, it was a revolution. Joseph Goebbels, Hitler's propaganda minister, found Bernays' approach very useful. Bernays acknowledged this fact in his 1965 autobiography entitled Biography of an Idea, where he wrote, Carl von Wiegen, foreign correspondent of the Hearst newspapers, an old hand at interpreting Europe and just returned from Germany, was telling us about Goebbels and his propaganda plans to consolidate Nazi power. Goebbels had shown Wiegen his propaganda library, the best vegan had ever seen. Goebbels, said vegan, was using my book Crystallizing Public Opinion as a basis for his destructive campaign against the Jews of Germany. Obviously, the attack on the Jews of Germany was no emotional outburst of the Nazis, but a deliberate, planned campaign. The invisible government that Walter Lippmann, Edward Bernays, and Woodrow Wilson had referred to was not just an abstract concept. It was a very real and concrete reality, and they were well positioned to comment on it because they directly participated in its creation. It all started as an inquiry. The inquiry to the select few who knew was a group of 150 men assembled by Woodrow Wilson to gather the data that they thought necessary to quote, make the world safe for democracy after World War I was over. Among the known members of the inquiry were Walter Lippmann, Paul Warburg, better known as the father of the Federal Reserve, and Edward House, Wilson's closest advisor, the man responsible for convincing Wilson to sign the Federal Reserve Act in 1913. From 1917 to 1918, the group compiled over 2,000 documents to be used during post-war negotiations. The most famous of these was the 14 Points document, authored by Walter Lippmann, which proposed the creation of the League of Nations, the predecessor of the United Nations. Then, to my surprise, they asked me to go over with, with Woodrow Wilson to the peace conference. And at the age of 1926, I was in Paris for the entire time of the peace conference that was held in the suburb of Paris. And we worked to make the world safe for democracy. That was a big slogan. After the Paris Peace Conference in 1919, a portion of the inquiry met at the Hotel Majestique with a number of British diplomats to discuss the forming of a permanent institution. This meeting eventually led to the decision to join forces with a group of high-ranking officers of banking, manufacturing, trading, and finance companies led by Elihu Root, a powerful corporate lawyer who was also a former United States Secretary of War and leading advocate of America's entry into World War I. On July 29, 1921, the merged group filed a certification of incorporation, officially forming the Council on Foreign Relations, also known as the CFR. The CFR went on to build a membership comprised of the world's most powerful business leaders, politicians, and corporations. Among the corporate members are Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan, Chevron, Exxon, Shell, BP Oil, General Electric, Raytheon, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, Boeing, Bloomberg, Rothschilds North America, and Dynacor International. You can find a complete list on the CFR website. It's good to be back at the Council on Foreign Relations. As uh, Pete mentioned, I've been a member for a long time and was actually a director for some period of time. I never mentioned that when I was campaigning for re-election back home in Wyoming. Thank you very much, um, Richard, and I am delighted to be here in these new headquarters. Um, I have been often to, uh, I guess, the mothership in New York City. 
uh, but it's good to have an outpost of the council right here down the street from the State Department. Uh, we get a lot of advice from the council, so this will mean I won't have as far to go to uh, be told uh, what we should be doing and uh, how uh, we should uh, think about the future. John Foster Dulles, Secretary of State under President Eisenhower, is listed as one of the founding members of the CFR on their own website. It was Dulles that convinced Eisenhower to use the CIA to topple the democratically elected Prime Minister of Iran, Mohammad Mosaddegh, in 1953. The Shah, the puppet who was installed in his place, was a brutal dictator. He enjoyed full support from the U.S. government until he was overthrown in the Islamic Revolution of 1979. Dulles was also the man behind the 1954 CIA coup in Guatemala, and remember Bernays ran the propaganda for that operation. The tactic that Bernays chose was to convince the public that the Guatemalan government was backed by the Soviets. No less a figure than John Foster Dulles, head of the State Department, was part of the firm of lawyers acting for the United Fruit Company. His brother Alan was the head of the CIA. So it didn't take much of an effort on their part to persuade their president, a military man, Mr. Eisenhower, to give them the green light to overthrow Arbenz's government. Once again, Bernays set a trend, and for the next 40 years, the U.S. government would use the specter of communism to justify invasions and covert operations around the globe. Carol Quigley was an author and professor of history at Georgetown University. He was also a personal mentor to President Bill Clinton. And then, as a student at Georgetown, I heard that call clarified by a professor named Carol Quigley. Quigley served as a consultant to the U.S. Department of Defense, the U.S. Navy, and the House Select Committee on Astronomics and Space Exploration. He was not a fringe lunatic by any stretch of the imagination, but was in fact a respected member of the establishment. That's what makes the statements he made in his book Tragedy and Hope so significant. Tragedy and Hope was a dense and highly detailed historical volume which covered world history from 1914, with an emphasis on analyzing the driving forces of civilization. The book was completely uncontroversial. That is, until you get to the middle, where he makes the following statement. There does exist and has existed for a generation an international Anglophile network which operates to some extent in the way that the radical right believes that the Communist Act. In fact, this network, which we may identify as the roundtable groups, has no aversion to cooperating with the Communists or any other groups, and frequently does so. I know of the operations of this network because I have studied it for 20 years, and I was permitted for two years in the early 1960s to examine its papers and secret records. I have no aversion to it or to most of its aims, and have for much of my life been close to it and to many of its instruments. I have objected both in the past and recently to a few of its policies, but in general my chief difference of opinion is that it wishes to remain unknown, and I believe its role in history is significant enough to be known. Quigley specifically identified the CFR and the Institute of International Affairs as key hubs in this roundtable network and he confirmed its close relationship to banking and finance. The Institute of International Affairs, also known as the Chatham House, is a sister organization of the CFR. It was created in 1920 by the British diplomats who attended the meeting at the Hotel Majestique in Paris in 1919. There are chapters of the Institute of International Affairs in Australia, Belgium, France, Italy, Portugal, Norway, Poland, Finland, Hungary, Sweden, New Zealand, South Africa, Nigeria, Pakistan, Singapore, Japan, and in other countries as well. The secret to the power that the Council on Foreign Relations and the other roundtable groups wield lies in a clever application of the techniques that Bernays developed. They target individual psychology by cultivating a sense of exclusivity and prestige, which plays upon people's desire to feel important and powerful. Like Bernays, they manipulate the public indirectly by targeting opinion leaders and authority figures, by influencing their membership, which is comprised of men and women in the highest levels of government business and finance, they hijack the phenomenon observed in the Milgram Authority experiments while bypassing the electoral process. Most of the meetings held at the CFR are run under Chatham House rules, meaning that the ideas discussed there may be used and spread by those present, but no one is allowed to mention where those ideas came from. These closed-door discussions and their exclusive membership process work together to engineer the phenomenon demonstrated in the Ash Conformity experiments. New members must be nominated by an existing member, seconded by three members, and approved by the board of directors. This process ensures that ideological continuity is maintained as social conformity brings new members into line with the group. It's important to remember that wealth, social status, and official positions of power do not reduce the effects of group psychology. We get a lot of advice from the council, so this will mean I won't have this far to go to uh, be told uh, what we should be doing and uh, how uh, we should uh, think about the future. 
put it in simple terms, the politicians aren't the ones calling the shots. They're just puppets. Voting the bums out doesn't work, and it hasn't for a long, long time. Now you know why. Even if we remove every single corrupt oligarch from the councils of government, we will end up right back in the same situation unless we deal with the psychological underpinnings of our enslavement. But how do we do that? How do we reach the group mind and shake the crowd from its slumber? Group psychology is a weapon. And like all weapons, it is capable of being used for good or for evil. For many years, it has been in the wrong hands. It has been hidden from the public and used against them. It's time for the people to pick up that weapon and use it to free themselves. It's time to start studying. Read Gustav Le Bon's books, The Crowd and the Psychology of Revolution. Read Edward Bernays' books, Propaganda and Crystallizing Public Opinion. And read Gene Sharp's books, From Dictatorship to Democracy and National Security Through Civilian-Based Defense. Learn the theory, learn the techniques, and start using them to spread the truth rather than hiding it. Start using them to prevent wars rather than start them. Start using them to stop the militarization of the police and to end the surveillance state. Use them to bring this corporate mafia to its knees. Some of you may find this proposition frightening. This is dangerous stuff. These are ideological M16s with boxes of ammunition. If even a few motivated individuals started using these techniques effectively, it could seriously disrupt the balance of power. But that is exactly what's needed. I challenge you to look around. Look at the state of the world. Look at where these psychopaths are taking us. If you do not feel the imperative to change the course that we are on, then you're not paying attention. A water hose is turn us around. We aren't going to let any injunction turn us around. If you feel as strongly as we do that the public needs to see this information, then make a commitment to get this film into the hands of as many people as possible.